Just some of the images of the aftermath of the shooting in Orlando, Florida, inside the Pulse nightclub early Sunday morning, claiming the lives of 49 people and injuring 53 others. News about the victims' identities is trickling out slowly. Many families are still waiting to hear if loved ones are among the victims of the worst mass shooting in U.S. history. Welcome to your Monday lunch break. I'm Tanya Rivero. Joining us now to discuss Sunday morning's events and what comes next is former NY PD Transit Bureau Commanding Officer Keith Thinger, founder and CEO of Crisis Management Group, ICMC. Welcome, Keith. It's so great to have you here. Let's start with the victims, if you will. What is going on right now? Walk us through the process of why it takes so long at this point. Okay, so now we're dealing with a obviously very, very sensitive crime scene, and there are a lot of victims within that crime scene, and it's in a large area, this club it would be a large area. So meticulously, what you have to do with a crime scene, you have to go over it very, very slowly. You have to make sure that the IDs that they are retrieving from the people are the right IDs, because they might not be the right IDs. Maybe somebody might want to get in there under, under age or, or, or what have you. So right now, what they're doing, meticulously going over the crime scene, they're dotting their I's, they're crossing their T's, and making sure they don't make any mistakes on this one. And there's no relief then for the families waiting in anguish. They just have to wait. No, right? unfortunately, you have to wait because if you don't do these things, Right. Um, you have to do it if right you don't do the these time. things slow and you don't do these things right, uh, you're really going to uh, have a problem with the investigation. Absolutely. Now, let's go over a bit what we know about the alleged gunman, U.S. citizen Omar Mateen. He had been twice investigated by the FBI before this, and we know that he also worked for a security company. Does that surprise you? It, it surprised me very much. Uh, he worked for a security company. Not only did he just work for any security company, but he worked for a security company that dealt with uh, uh, or worked in conjunction with DHS, border security, ICE. So what type of level of security does he have? I mean, what can he get into? What could he look at? Also, obviously, he had the level of where he needed a firearm because he needed a firearm for his security job, which is another baffling situation yes. because the FBI um, investigated him in 2013, 2014. I mean, that should have been a flag. His, his, if he had firearms already, they should have been taken away. And if he didn't have the firearms uh, at that point, when he did apply for the firearms, bells and whistles should have went off and he should have not gotten any firearms. Absolutely. A lot will come out about this in the future, I'm sure. Knowing what you know about a, a city equipped to deal with terrorism, how equipped do you think Orlando was to deal with something like this? Uh, Orlando had a, their response, I must say, was very, very good. Mm -hmm. Are they equipped as somebody like an NYPD or an LAPD? No, they just don't have the resources like the NYPD and the LAPD do. NYPD has a whole section of the department devoted to anti-terrorism, and they have a whole uh, operational room, a whole war room regarding uh, 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 anti-terrorism. So no, Orlando is not going to have the resources, although they did a great job right. uh, in responding and, and, and getting there and, and, and securing the area. Um, Tell us about the logistics between departments, though, and what kinds of weaknesses can be exposed during an event like this that you can't genuinely prepare for. Oh, for sure. The weaknesses could be, how is our response time? When we got there, did we do what we were supposed to do? Do we have the avenues covered to where we need to get people to the hospital? Was EMS in the right staging area? Do we have a triage area? I mean, all these things go through your head. And at the end of, the, at the end of this incident, they'll all uh, 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 take a step back and, and they'll see where, where they're lacking. And, 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 and that's what they're going to have to do. They're going to have to move forward. Absolutely. Now, right now, as it stands, this appears to be a lone wolf scenario. We don't know if there was anyone else involved yet. Are these lone wolf attacks more dangerous because they don't, they don't seem to be linked to anyone? Well, I don't like calling it a lone wolf, especially when ISIS three days ago called, called for, you know, let's get out there and let's attack people right. and, and, and this and that. No, this is, this is obviously uh, uh, ISIS, and, 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 he was, and, and he was definitely doing this uh, for the name of ISIS because on his 911 phone call, he had, he had uh, 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 said the ISIS leader's name right. re, uh, uh, you know, regarding to what he was about to do. So, sure. no, th I, I don't consider it lone wolf because... When, when ISIS comes out and says, you know, 
uh, everybody around the world should, should do an attack of some sort. So even if there's not a direct, a, a direct connection to an individual within that organization, that's still enough of a connection? Oh, of, of course. It's kind of like uh, John Gotti uh, saying, listen, you got to do the hit. But you don't have direct contact with John Gotti. You're just a soldier out in the field doing the hit. Right, absolutely. So go looking at the scenario, looking forward, what would you like to see happen so that something like this is prevented in the future? Well, one of the things I would like to see, and one of the things I would like to know, did the FBI give the intelligence to local police agencies? Because we know that the FBI did not do that for Boston. So did they do it uh, 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 for this incident? Uh, and if not, we need more coordination between the FBI uh, and, and local police departments. That's something that local police departments have been calling for a while, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, FBI's funding has been cut uh, uh, drastically in, in, in recent years, so maybe they don't have the funding. Well, we need to get funding so there is a connection between the FBI and local law enforcement in, uh, in this area. Also, we need human intelligence. We need to get people inside. Um, you know, if we could get people inside like we did with the, with the mafia, what's going on? Who's doing what? Where are they gathering? How are they doing it? What's their MOs? You know, and things of that nature. Or who are they dealing with? And that's what we need to do. We need human intelligence, which we just don't have right now. And we need the human intelligence also in Afghanistan and in the places that we're fighting abroad. The human intelligence is very, very necessary, and we just don't have it yet. So on the ground, that sort of very localized intelligence. Correct. Keith Singer, thank you so much. Thank you, for Tanya, that. for so having nice me. To thank see you. you. Thank you. And in a solidarity, in a show of solidarity with the victims, LGBT community supporters around the world are uniting after the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history, which took place at a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida. We leave you now with reactions from the LGBT community. A world in which we will all live fully with dignity and with peace for each one of us and our traditions. We pray that God is with us, the God that loves us, and the God who is weeping today with those who have been killed. Today, we must stand united. For many years, members of the LGBTQIA community have stood shoulder to shoulder with the Muslim community our lives matter, whether you're black, trans, queer, whatever, you deserve to be on this planet because God put you here. And if you don't believe in God, you exist and you matter no matter what. I am a black, gay, Muslim. And... I'm also from Florida. So this is literally a tragedy that could have happened to me. It could have happened to uh, people that I love very dearly. LGBT phobia mata. LGBT phobia mata. A luta LGBT. A luta LGBT. Salva vidas. Salva vidas. There's much to say about the violence in our world today. That. Uh, I, I, I've always tended to be a pacifist. I think violence at the personal level uh, or, or a state level is, is, is uh, abhorrent. Uh, and um, I share everyone else's um, um, feeling, uh, feelings of distress.
Fasting is often associated with fad diets and quick weight loss, but can it actually make you healthier? Researchers are exploring ways intermittent fasting diets can treat everything from asthma and cardiovascular disease to autoimmune diseases and even chemo side effects. Here with the story is WSJ health reporter Sumathi Reddy. Hi, Sumathi. Good to Hi. see you. So outside of its role in certain religious ceremonies, fad diets often call for fasting, which gives fasting a bad rap. Mm -hmm. But you're mm -hmm. saying that there's a lot of evidence now that it can actually make people healthier. We have a, a lot of intriguing studies that have looked at fasting as a way of treating, potentially treating, a whole host of different diseases. So, so what are we talking about exactly when we say fasting in the, in the context of treating diseases? Yeah. It's not a starvation diet, obviously. No, so this is not, you know, the complete sort of abstaining from food right. and, and drink kind of diet. These are generally, like, people talk about them as periodic fasting, and they're very low-calorie diets. So it's usually, you know, eating anywhere from 500 calories to 1,100, depending on the diet, uh, a few times a week or a few times a month. Right. Okay. So let's look at some of the ways it seems to be helping different patients. So multiple sclerosis patients have been showing some improvement on a fasting diet, well, This is very new research. New there research. There was a study right. published by just earlier this month. And it was using both mice and humans, and it found in the mice that most of them were 100% uh, were re re reduced symptoms, and 20% of them actually had eliminated MS symptoms. Interesting. So that was pretty conclusive evidence. And what um, about the human? The humans was a pilot study, so they're doing a larger study now. But they also showed a reduction in symptoms, and it was a very severe diet. It was like 300 to 400 calories a day for about a week. So now um, that's, they realize that's not feasible for the average person or right. the average MS patient. So they want to redo that using a higher calorie amount. And what is actually happening? There seems to be a regeneration of good cells and a, an elimination of bad cells. So yeah, so in the, with the MS patients, um, the mechanism is believed to sort of kill the autoimmune T cells, which are the ones that are sort of damaging the spine, and then regenerating new healthy cells, which... Um, for MS patients is good for in terms of uh, nerve damage. Absolutely. And now there is some research looking into whether the, this intermittent fasting can actually help cancer patients as well, correct? Yeah, so there's been am animal studies that have found that um, periodic fasting can reduce symptoms with chemotherapy, and there's some evidence that it could also potentially kill fewer cancer cells and protect healthy cells. So now they're in the midst of clinical trials with humans, and some of that work should be published very soon. So that sounds very promising. Let's yeah. talk about some of the specific diets that are out there right now. I know there's one called the 5 to 2 diet. Is that how you Yeah, so that's one of the fad ones you hear about a lot. Yeah. Although at the National Institutes of Health, that's the one they use a lot. And it's basically a week of, um, in, a, in your average week, there'll be two days in that week where you'll restrict your calories to about 500 and the rest of the week you're eating normal. You're eating normally. You're not overeating to compensate for the calories you missed on those two days, no, right? No, no. <laughs> you're just eating normally. Yeah. And that's shown to have benefits even for people that aren't suffering from a various disease. Yeah, so that's, they've used that there for asthma and for mm -hmm. some of the cancer studies and other things. And the other big diet um, that some researchers in California are doing, this is, these are the ones who did the MS study, is um, they call it a fasting mimicking diet. So you're fasting just for five days in a whole month. Right. And there's also something called the Prolon diet. So that's based on this fasting mimicking diet. Okay. It's a commercial product that just just launched recently. But you need a prescription for it. Yes, correct? prescription only okay. at the moment. Okay. Um, and it's it's what I'm talking. It's, it's that five day a month diet. Right. Where you're reducing calories. I think it's about 1,100 the first day, and mm -hmm. then seven to 800 the following four days. So yeah. is there any indication that for a relatively healthy person like you or me, there might mm -hmm. be some advantages to a fasting diet every now and again? I mean, not a benefit of all these. Of all, anytime you do this for any condition that you do lose weight. Right. <laughs> so in that sense, yes. Right. But in general, they say it's really for people who, I mean, if you're trying to prevent diabetes or cardiovascular disease or, you know, any of those things, this could be beneficial. It could be. It always sounds like a good idea, and I, I can never quite pull it off. Yeah. <laughs> Sumathi, thank you so much sure. for that. And one of the latest ways banks are keeping high net worth clients happy may surprise you. We'll tell you what it is after the break. Thank you.
Along with estate planning and investment management, financial firms have something relatively new to offer their high net worth families, a chronicle of the family's history. Joining us now to discuss is WSJ reporter Emily Glazer. Welcome, Emily. So where did this trend come from? Did the bank start offering it or did the family start asking for it? The family started asking for it. And if you're an ultra high net worth family, which could mean anything, but you usually have tens of millions of dollars, you have the money to spend to learn more about your heritage and your history. And why not? So do these financial firms then do it themselves or do they work with outside companies? And what sorts of services exactly are they offering? It's a little bit of a mix. Wells Fargo's ultra high net worth unit, Abbott Downing, which means uh, clients have at least 50 million of investable assets. So this is a lot, a lot of, that we're talking about. Yeah. They uh, do it for free for their clients. But like I mentioned, you have to have a certain threshold of money you're investing with them. That's right. Um, they've been doing this for about a decade. So they're one of the longest serving uh, units of, that's offering these services. And new ones have popped up. Family Office, Pitt Karen in Philadelphia now offers it. Um, Morgan Stanley started in January. They outsource it. So the clients would end up paying like a genealogy service. Um, and that could be tens of thousands of dollars. Tens of thousands up to hundreds of thousands. Depending they, on what they want. Because exactly. tell us about the offerings. It's not just about a family tree, although you can get that too. There's, it's a lot more elaborate. Definitely. Uh, so so the offerings can range from anything like genealogy services, so it can trace back your family roots, and it can be more expensive if those people are traveling overseas to figure out where your family is or if there was sort of unknown history and there are very specific documents to gather. There are also these really elaborate videos, and this was really fun to report. Full-fledged productions, crews, makeup, lighting. Even using drones, yes, right? We have some drones. of the drone fit footage, <laughs> which is amazing, which we'll roll for you right now. Shows, I guess drones are good if you want to show your real estate holding. The aerial shot. The aerial shot. what some of these folks want. And I even spoke with a real estate family um, that owns Max Properties, a family-owned business. They're using drones to capture the different real estate holdings that their company owns. So it's not just their private residence. And that, this can be, uh, depending on what you get, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Because it's important to show the grandkids, you know, what you have accomplished in your lifetime. Which brings me to my next point. Is this about the kids? Is this about the grandkids? Is this about letting them know where their family comes from? Is that the real driver here? When I spoke with the clients, that was the main point I heard, which was we want future generations to understand what our family went through, what our mission is as a family, our core values, and some of those things, it's really hard to just write it down and pass it along. Right. People do do that. That's called the ethical will, yeah. I learned. Um, but to be able to show it and really capture the patriarchy or matriarch's history and their stories was like invaluable to these families. Well, it's important to hear that because otherwise it can look like the latest way of pandering to the vanity of ultra high net worth individuals. But if it is about making a family connection and also you wrote about the fact that some adopted children really like seeing the way their family tree ends up connecting with their adopted family tree mm -hmm. if you go back far enough. Yeah, Abbott Downing um, from Wells Fargo does that. They also looked um, sometimes at medical histories of families too. So, you know, if there's certain genetic testing and you learn things that might be helpful. Very important. And um, look, I mean, it is pandering a little bit. Let's yeah. let's not, yeah. you know, go past that. Sure. But I think what these firms found is not only do they deepen their relationships with their client, which at this phase and when it's that much money, it's hugely important. But meeting the kids and getting to know the kids can be just as important. And talk about no expense spared. You wrote about one family that sent a private plane to pick up every single grandchild for the screening of the family yes. film, correct? Apparently it started at <laughs> three in the morning. They went to different college campuses. They got everyone there so they could go to church, watch the film, have lunch, and then disperse. Sounds great. What a Love fun it. afternoon. All right, Emily Glazer, thank you so much. Thank for that. you. And that's your lunch break for today. I'm Tanya Rivero. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great afternoon.